Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. We've been following the story of Jesus through the Gospel of John, and uh, we're up to chapter 11. <coughs> and chapter 11 and 12, particularly chapter 11, is a little bit of a culmination, really, <coughs> because the Gospel is there to portray what Jesus Christ is really like and it does this by um, a series of signs. And this is the sixth sign in the book. A series of signs to, to show that Jesus is unlike anybody else. In fact, it's a series of signs or miracles, some people would call them. But particularly, they're, they're miracles with a purpose. And they're there so that we might understand that this Jesus, born in Nazareth, is um, Christ, the Christ, the Son of God, and believing that we might have life in his name. And so we've gone through a number of encounters that Jesus had with, with um, individuals and groups of people. And, and this chapter 11, and you probably know the story, I think all of you would know the story, uh, of um, the death and resurrection of Lazarus. <laughs> we haven't reached the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, each one of us have a particular perspective of what Jesus Christ is like. I don't know what you think about. Um, if you were to ask uh, your friends or neighbours or acquaintances about who do you think Jesus Christ is or, or what impression do you have of him, you would probably get something that's not a true impression. And my belief is that when we see Jesus as he really is, it provokes one of two responses. And we'll see those responses in this chapter particularly. One of those responses is a response of faith. Because we see in him something that we've never seen in anybody else. We see in him an interest and a concern and a compassion and an understanding of me as an individual, such as no one else has. And it, it, it prompts, um, well, we heard it this morning, it prompts a response of love. Yes, Lord, I love you. But the other response that it can prompt is a response, <laughs> paradoxically, it seems, of hatred. Of hatred. A response that's it seems in this chapter almost irrational because there were men and women presumably who having heard and known and seen Jesus raise a man from the dead were prepared to deny him and even wanted later to kill the man that had been raised from the dead, Lazarus himself, because he was, it would cause too much trouble, wouldn't it? What they were saying is that this Jesus has demonstrated by his life and signs that he is who he is and we cannot abide that. So we must cover it up. And it's the testimony of Paul in the book of Romans when he says that they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And I don't know why we do it, but we do. I've been doing it somewhat this week. I felt a bit depressed about certain things, my wife will tell you. And, and that's how I feel. But it's a foolish thing. Because when we look at Christ and his control and, and who he is, we should have so much confidence in him. I should never be depressed. And so we, we're going to follow this. It's a lovely story. It's probably one of my favourite stories in the scriptures uh, because it not only reveals uh, something about Christ that is, that is so elevating and encouraging, but it, it actually it, it is so human and down to earth. It reveals how you and how I would behave in a situation like this. I think almost certainly. And we see the, the wonderful way that this man, Jesus, deals with the difficulties and the subtleties and the complexities 
of this circumstance. We start in the beginning of chapter 11, and there's, there's three parts to this chapter. If you like, there's a waiting part. We'll look at that first. Uh, there's a, a, an assurance part, if you like. We'll look at that next. And there's, um, then there's the, the actual engagement of Jesus with the needs, his compassion, his weeping, and his final raising from the dead of this man, Lazarus. The story begins, a certain man was ill, Lazarus, uh, and this is in chapter 11 of John, and uh, verse 1, uh, of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. Now, that, that's actually described in the next chapter. So it's, I guess it's just making the connection. It was this, this was the same Mary who subsequently, if you like, prepared, symbolically prepared Christ for his burial, his death. We're very close now to the death, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We're at the door. In fact, what Christ does here is even more wonderful and caring and compassionate when you see that this event was what was the final straw that in fact brought about the crucifixion. I suppose from a human level it brought it about. From a divine level God had purposed this whole occurrence. But from a human level he, what Christ did was risking all, if you like. He was risking his own life in order to save this man's life as a picture of the cross to come. So it was this Mary who anointed the feet, uh, wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, as they would, because they knew Jesus. Jesus was their friend. They knew something of his power. They, they knew all the stories, how he had healed the lame man and had, he'd healed the blind and he'd fed 5,000 with just a, 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 some fish and loaves. They knew that they had heard the story of the wedding where the water had been turned into wine. They knew all of this. So who else are they going to ask? Who would you ask? <laughs> and they asked, so they sent for him and with this lovely little request, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And Jesus did love him. That was quite evident. Um, because it, it, it reaffirms that in verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So this person is ill. And when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness, illness does not lead to death. It does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. There are two themes that pervade this chapter. Well, probably pervade the book, but especially here. One is the glory of God, and the other one is faith or belief. And the two come together at the end of the chapter because uh, in believing, we bring glory to God. Isn't that strange? In believing him, we bring glory to God. I mean, people sometimes talk about glorifying God in, in singing and all of those things, and I, I know we can. But you know that in, because believing is an expression of trust, it's really saying, I believe you are who you claim to be. I believe that you're trustworthy. I'm prepared to trust you, and in doing so, we bring glory to God. And so the, one of the reasons for this whole incident, and of course God's weaving his tapestry with many, many threads, okay, but one of, the, one of the, the, the important elements in this is that all that's going to happen around this is for the glory of God. So what happens? Jesus, it reaffirms in verse 5, he loves Martha and her sister. Lazarus, you know this. And when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, quite probably, Lazarus is prob almost, probably might even be dead now. <laughs> when you look at the sums, because when he was taken out of the tomb, he'd been there four days. <clears throat> they waited two days here. But be that as it may, 
Jesus' response is different to my response. <laughs> goes without saying. There is a sense in which it's very hard for us to wait. It, it is so hard. We want God to do something now. Maybe we feel that if he doesn't act now, he will miss his window of opportunity because that's how things work for us. You know, um, carpe diem, seize the day. You know, while the opportunity is there, grab it. Otherwise, if you don't grab it now, you'll lose it. And I think sometimes we feel that, maybe, maybe we feel that God's in that circumstance. Lazarus is ill. You better do something. You have to do something. And so, uh, so it is that um, uh, the disciples are probably feeling this. I'm sure they're feeling this. Uh, others were feeling it, we'll see, as we move on. So they wait two days. And then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Now, now the conflict is there. See, he had in chapter 10, there had been that, that affirmation that before Abraham, no, chapter 9, before Abraham was, I am. No, it's chapter 10, in fact. Before Abraham was, I am. He, he was claiming uh, equality with God, really. And he had already, in chapter 5, he had, he had said, as the Father is working, I am working. And he called God his Father, so he made himself equal with God. And as we go through uh, those encounters, we're finding an increasing intensity of opposition. So now it's the stage where it's not safe for him to go to Jerusalem. It's not safe. So here, Jesus, at a human level, is faced with a choice. Is he going to go and help and risk his own life? Or is he going to stay out of the crowds, stay safe? Of course, this wasn't a conflict for Jesus. He, he knew exactly what he was going to do. But remember, this is a very human story. This is how we would have perceived it, walking along with Jesus. Uh, and um, they, they remind him that uh, people are seeking to stone him. And Jesus said, ah, they're not for 12 hours in a day. If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And after saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And like good amateur physicians, they figure, well, he's sleeping, he'll be okay, he'll recover, it's good to sleep. And so Jesus makes it clear, the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. And Jesus had spoken, but Jesus had spoken of his death, and then they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. And then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And look what he says then. Oh, we would never say this. And for your sake, I am glad. That doesn't make sense. I know we know the end of the story, but you see, they didn't know the end of the story. They didn't know the end of the story. Lazarus has died. He's not just asleep, he's dead. And I'm actually glad... When my uh, mother passed away, I can't say I was glad. When my father died, I can't say I was glad. But there is a sense now where I'm glad. <laughs> There's a verse from this chapter, actually, that sits at the grave site. You can guess which one it is. <laughs> Not difficult. So much that God allows in my life and in your lives, right? if we could see it from his perspective, he would probably say, I am glad. Now, not glad in the sense that I love to see the suffering or I love to see the trouble. You know, death of his saints, it says in the scriptures, is precious in his sight. It's not that somehow God rejoices in the, the 
the consequence of sin. But he sees the end from the beginning. He sees the end from the beginning. And because he could see the end from the beginning, he was able to say to these disciples, actually Lazarus is dead, and you know what? I'm glad he's dead. I'm glad he's dead. And why, what reason does he give? He says, um, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And so Thomas called the twin, said to his dis- the fellow disciples, again misunderstanding him. They, this was a common trait of the disciples, constantly misunderstanding Jesus. Let us also go that we may die with him. So let's just reflect on that. I guess I don't know what struggles you're going through at the moment. Uh, I don't know what decisions you're seeking to make. I don't know how you're evaluating your place in life and, and, and your relationship with God. We may all be at different places and maybe you'll be tomorrow in a different place than you are today. But it's, a, it's an encouraging thing, it's a comforting thing to recognise that that God, in the reverses of life, can be glad for us because he can be working together all things for good to them that love God. That's easy to say, isn't it? But in practice, that's not how I feel. But sometimes we just have to take hold of the truth and believe it. I can't change my feeling, (laughs) but I can look unto Jesus and I can say, Lord, as best as I know how, I'm, just, I'm going to trust you. And these disciples evidently did. They didn't understand it. Thomas was prepared to go even if it meant their death. So in their sort of muddling kind of way, they said, well, we're gonna, we will follow you, as they had. So that's the first part. That's the weight. Then we come from verse 17 to 27. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. I right, remember two days wait, so he may well have been dead right at the beginning uh, when the messenger came. But Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So here's this scene we have with everybody weeping. Martha and Mary had lost their brother. Uh, they are distraught, they are distressed. Uh, as we'll see, they were questioning, why on earth hadn't Jesus done something? Exactly the same as you and I do. Why on earth didn't Jesus do something? Why did he not? Did he not care for these people? Did he not care about the distress that was being experienced? Does he not care about me and my circumstance? So this was the scene he comes into. And and so um, in verse 20, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, oh, I don't know how this would have hit his heart. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's almost like a rebuke, isn't it? Later on, uh, it tells us um, from the crowd, uh, um, could not he who, who uh, performed these miracles essentially uh, not kept this man from dying? Surely he could have. And he could have. Huh? He could have. And so she asks this question. And Jesus says to her, now you see, this is the wonder of it all. We only see on a very limited human plane. We see the circumstance. I see my own circumstance. I get discouraged about things or I may get depressed about things. But Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. First of all, he states the truth. See, one of the characteristics of the Son of God, which this book is, is affirming, that Jesus is the Son of God, is that he is the author of life. 
This is our principal problem, by the way. <laughs> no life. Death. Right? You can collapse all the problems down to this, this one thing. Right? When Adam sinned against God, it tells us in the, in, the, in the first book of the Bible, it says, in the day that you sin, in the day that you disobey me, what would happen? You shall surely die. Die. Now, death actually doesn't really exist. <laughs> Only life exists. Death is what happens when you don't have life, when it's taken away. There was no life until God gave it. Lazarus didn't have life because somehow it was all going well and then he died. Lazarus only had life because God had given him life and now he had taken it back. And, and when we start to see that Jesus is the author, the creator of life, we see this in a different perspective. Because he says to her, first of all, your brother will rise. And Martha said, well, I, I know, you know, I know my theology in the last day. <laughs> Again, in the resurrection on the last day, I know he'll rise. So she has this hope. And Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I created it all. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He said, let there be light, and there was light. And then when he created man, he breathed in him and, and made him a living soul. He gave life. Every one of us have life here, if we haven't. I think you're all living, hopefully. Even if you're asleep, you're all living. Every one of us have life because of God the breath of God. That's it. You have no control really at all. You think you're right because we've got a medical system to support us. Maybe because we've got the sort of medical system we've got, you think you're not all right, but anyway. <laughs> you, or, or you think that you know the advance in science and, and technology means that we can prolong things and we can fix it. We can't. We can't. As by one man sin entered in the world and death by sin and death passed upon all men for all have sinned. We can't. I know we can sort of help the body heal and there are some fine physicians and, and fine doctors and medical people. I'm thankful for them all. But they can't give life. They can't give life. They can't even really heal. They can help the body heal itself. You know that if you cut a corpse, the wound doesn't heal. So I'm told. I haven't tried that. It's only a living person that heals. God at work. And so Jesus, what Jesus is telling her here, when he says, I'm the resurrection of life, he could well be saying, look, I'm the creator. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. We see it right at the beginning of the gospel. Whoever believes in me, though he die, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe it? Remember, she's the one that said, Lord, if you had been here... He wouldn't have died. And Jesus, in his compassionate way, gives her these words of truth, of reality. And, and I don't know what's dawning on her here. I mean, she, she already had a confidence in him and a trust in him. But this only would have elevated it. And she said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. This is why the gospel was written, so that people like Martha would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and believing she would have life. And she had it. She had life. And it goes on that when she had said this, she went and called Mary, uh, Sister Mary 
They said in private, the teacher is here, he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. And when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord... If you had been here, my brother would not have died. (laughs) They both believed something about Jesus, didn't they? They both believed that he did have the power of God. They both believed that he could heal. (laughs) But they hadn't quite got there. Lord, I do believe that you can give me life, eternal life. But what if I'm ill? What if I'm dying? Can I still believe that? Who do Mary and Martha think Jesus is? He's certainly special. She's just confessed him, Martha, as the Christ to come, as the Son of God. Now when Jesus sees her weeping, the Jews who had, moved, uh, who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And then said to, they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the New Testament. Poignant verse, Jesus wept. Volumes have been written, by the way, about why Jesus wept. You know, at one level you could think, but he he already knows. Great to see you, Jimmy. No, that's okay. He already knows um, what's going to happen. Why would he have to weep? He understands. He understands a short moment later that Lazarus is going to come out of that tomb walking. Why did he weep? Well, he was human. He was compassionate. Do you ever weep because someone else is weeping? You know, sometimes that's enough to break me down. You know, you're holding it together in a funeral or whatever and then you see somebody else break down and you think, just in a sense of empathy with them, you feel, I don't know, for an instant you feel the same with them. You think, I could be there. It wasn't my parent or it wasn't my child or it wasn't my, uh, a friend, but I can, I can, I'm there with that person, you see. And Jesus saw all of this. And he saw more than that. He, he saw death. And the devastation that sin had caused. More than any of us see it. And as we live longer, we see more of the devastation of sin. And every time we disobey God, even in the things that we think don't matter so much, we're we're creating a a web of corruption. And we need the grace of God to disentangle that. We somehow feel that if, if if we... to obey God is somehow bad for us. <laughs> we want to fight against God. And he sees what is the consequence of this disobedience. He sees man willfully set his face against a loving creator. He saw, perhaps he's seeing Looking forward, I'm sure he is, to the the ultimate consequence of man's sin, of your sin and of my sin, that nailed to the tree this Christ of God dying for me. And Jesus wept. And they looked on and said, see how he loved him. Well, he did. (laughs) They only saw a little bit of how he loved him. 
See, he was glad that they had waited back at the beginning of chapter. He was glad that he hadn't been there to keep Lazarus from dying. He was glad about that, but not glad in the sense that he was uh, overwhelmed with joy that death was happening everywhere, but glad because he could see the end. He could see that in all of this tragedy, God could make it right. And this is the great hope that we have. In all of the tragedy of the world, in, in, in all, all the mess, and, you, and really, it doesn't matter what persuasion you are, you have to agree that the world's in a mess. It's in a mess. But we can know that God is going to make it right. Don't know how. You'd have to be God to know how. Such is the mess of sin. And he's going to make it right. And here he weeps. And these people, I guess, would further add to the grief, if you like, when they say, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Three times he's heard this, by the way, now. From Martha he heard it. (laughs) If you'd been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. From Mary he heard it, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And now that the crowd is murmuring, you know, surely if he had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And that's true. He wouldn't, wouldn't have died. Oh, chapter 11 of John. And we're around verse 35 after Jesus wept. And now we turn to uh, 38, 1138. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and the stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. You know the end of the story, but it's, 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 it's such a drama. If you were to place yourself there. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord, she still didn't get it. (laughs) Well, she loved him. Just like the women at the tomb of Jesus, they went there because they loved him, but they still didn't know. They, they, They didn't really understand and believe that he had risen from the dead. But nevertheless, they loved him. And I think sometimes Jesus is more concerned that we love him than that we have at all figured out. And she loved him, but she hadn't had it figured out here. And she said, well, look, Lord, by this time, you know, like the King James, it says he stinketh, I think. (laughs) There'll be an odour. It's four days, dead body. I don't know how long it takes to start to smell, but uh, especially in the warm climate there, I would imagine. And he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they, and, and when they see the glory of God, God is glorified. So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. See, there's a strain in all of this, in this, not only that they see the works of God, but they see that they are the works of God. Not only that they see Jesus, but they see that he is the Son of God. And so he prays in this way, that people would see the affirmation of the Father. In the next chapter, by the way, he affirms it again. There's a voice that affirms it. But here he prays like this, and when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come out. A stone's been rolled away. In there, there's a corpse. Four days I guess just to make absolutely sure, (laughs) you can't revive a corpse four days. The man is dead. Jesus 
didn't need to tell him to go. Well, he couldn't go and wash in the pool of Siloam like the blind man. He, did, he didn't have to do anything special. You see, every time Jesus uh, does something in the performance of a miracle that, that, that's more than just a response to his words, it's because he has some other purpose in it. All he needs is a word. He probably didn't even need to say the word. But for their sake, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. Maybe for Lazarus' sake too, because when Lazarus raised from the dead, he probably was giving him guidance about coming out. Maybe he didn't know what to do. So he comes out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. And so they did. They did. And many of the Jews, we now read about the response. And this is, this is fascinating. That many of the Jews, in verse 45, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. This is for the glory of God that they might see and they might believe. This was one of the reasons this happened in this way. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done and the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? And this is where they have a discussion about, um, you know, this is their completely irrational discussion. (laughs) There is evidence here. We know that Jesus raised the man from the dead. Rather than think, perhaps this must be the Messiah, This must be Christ, the son of the living God. We have to believe him. No, rather than do that, they want to plot how to kill him. Now, how does that make sense? See, this is our... We do a lot of things that don't make sense, really, don't we? (coughs) We do so much that doesn't make any sense at all. And here, in their face, there was the evidence of the Lord of life being here. They won't believe. Do you think that can happen today? Damn, dead right. You know, in Luke 16, when Jesus told of the man who died and went to Hades, uh, and he has a conversation with Abraham. It, it depicts this conversation. And he said, Lord, look, if you send me back, um, and I send Lazarus, send the poor man back so that my brothers can see, if they were to see one risen from the dead, then they'll believe. That's what he said. And you know what the answer was that Abraham got okay? I know you know it, don't you? But but isn't it a confronting answer? He said, they have Moses and the prophets. They've got the scriptures. They've got the testimony of God. And if they won't believe that, then they won't believe even though one were to be raised from the dead. And here we have it illustrated clearly and painfully that these people that hadn't yet seen Jesus raised from the dead, but the response was the same. They had seen his power over life. What does Jesus need to do for you to trust him with your life? What does he need to do for you to step out and obey him? What does he need to do for you to give something up, perhaps, that isn't being a help in your Christian walk? What does he need to do further for you to step out and perhaps give of yourself for someone? Or look not only on your own things but also on the things of others. What does he need to do more? He raised Lazarus from the dead and yet were those who wouldn't believe. There were those who believed but there were those who not only wouldn't believe but they wanted to put him to death. In verse 53 we read, So from that day on they made plans to put him to death, and Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews. (laughs) 
Lazarus had life. They threw a bit of a party for him in the next chapter. But do you know something about Lazarus? He died again. It was a temporary reprieve. And every one of us are going to die. That's what the word mortal means. We have the seed of death in us. Now we may prolong it. It may be shorter. And there's only one hope that we can have. It's the hope of verse 35, that Jesus is the resurrection. Or 25, isn't it? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in him, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in him shall never die. That's the only hope we have. And that's a question to each of us. I know most of you would say, I believe. But does our faith carry with it the response of seeing Jesus like this? Seeing a Jesus who could do, uh, who could bring from the dead life, who could bring in our own deadness of life, life, who could do some things in us and through us that you could call living and purposeful and worthwhile, who could create where there's a, a bitterness or a hatred, a love or a forgiveness or a willingness to trust him or a willingness to obey him where once I've disobeyed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this lovely story, uh, for this lovely true story, this incident that reveals to us um, the wonder of a saviour. Um, and it's little wonder uh, that the hymn writer wrote, Jesus, the very thought of thee with can't remember it with sweetness fills my breast but sweeter far thy face to see and in thy presence rest and so we give you thanks in the name of our saviour Jesus Christ Amen.